introduce the last panel lecture for this year. The panel lecture started in 2002 when Morgan and Michael Heller from London made the donation to the Interdisciplinary Center for the Neural Computation, ICMC, to establish a high profile series of lectures named after them, the Heller Lectures in Computational Neuroscience. Things changed since then, the ICMC became ELSEC, and Michael Heller became Sir Michael, but still, uh, we continue the, to hold the, the, the other lecture series. The, this series uh, covers a range of topics that reflect the interest of researchers at LSEC, from molecular to cellular to systems, neuroscience, cognitive psychology, modeling, and philosophy. The Hebrew University, in particular LSEC, are indebted to the Heller of the region and general. Today's Heller lecturer is Professor Massimo Candiani from the University of California, San Francisco. Yesterday, Adi Migrati already provided uh, an introduction, which I will not repeat now. Uh, at this point of the introduction, uh, we are usually supposed to say a few words about the science, but uh, Massimo will do it much better than me. So I will just uh, uh, share with you one moment uh, in 2011, when I discovered Massimo's work in a poster session in a meeting in London. Uh, and uh, I uh, distinctly remember, I mean, I don't remember much about the lectures of this, of this, uh, in this meeting, but I distinctly remember this poster uh, about uh, optogenetic uh, manipulation of inhibitory uh, of PV, PV interneurons in uh, visual cortex. Um, I think it would be fair to say that uh, Massimo's work really transformed the question, the type of question that we pose about at the circuit level uh, about processing in cortex. And at this point, I will stop and invite you to give the lecture. Ah, before, before that, I have to give you the certificate. Okay? So, the Heller Lecture Series in Computational Neuroscience awards the Certificate of Recognition and Appreciation to Professor Massimo Scandiani for his contributions to academic inquiry and exchange at the Edmond and Lili Safa Center for Brain Sciences, and so on and so forth. Thank you, Massimo. Thank you very much, Eli. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for the certificate. Beautiful. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's really an honor to be here, and, uh, and also a great pleasure. Um, today, um, uh, in contrast to yesterday, I spoke about two very specific projects that uh, were going on in my lab. Well, today I would like to give you more of an overview about our work on uh, uh, the circuits of visual cortex and uh, how they perform uh, uh, very specific, uh, very specific operations. So while the, maybe the first one or two slides are going to be the same as the one that you saw yesterday, don't run away. Uh, all the rest of the lecture will be very different, at least for those ones who were here, uh, who were here yesterday. So, so, so the work, uh, the work uh, of the past uh, 60 years by system neuroscience has uh, revealed uh, some um, incredible computations performed by the cortex, in this example, in particular by visual cortex. Uh, and this is the ability of uh, sensory cortices to extract very specific features of uh, the environment, uh, like the orientation uh, of a luminance edge, the direction of that luminance edge, or the length of, of that edge, and, and so on. And this uh, simply by sticking a metawire in uh, the cortex, uh, of, of an animal, right? Uh, uh, you can discover this magic. And this has fascinated the scores uh, of neuroscientists uh, since and, and triggered the imagination of many. Um, in an effort uh, that, that really predates uh, uh, the system neuroscience effort, and it's the one of anatomists and cellular anatomists and afterward uh, of uh, cellular physiologists, uh, the actual components uh, of uh, the cortex have been described in great detail. And this is an effort that continues today with the description of the molecular identity and the transcriptomic identity of, uh, of the components of the cortex. 
And so we know that the cortex is composed of functionally, anatomically, and molecularly different neuron types, that uh, the connectivity pattern between those neurons are very specific, <coughs> and that the physiological properties, both of the neuron and, the, uh, and of the contact between those neurons, are also very specific. Now, despite this uh, detailed knowledge that we have uh, about uh, the component and their interaction properties uh, of uh, the cortex, uh, uh, we still know very little about how the properties uh, of the cortex, of the cellular property of the cortex, gives rise to um, the magic of the cortex, its ability to extract those uh, features of the environment, uh, for example, as illustrated here. And as I was mentioning yesterday, the past uh, seven or eight years, the main effort of my lab has been uh, to bridge the gap between cellular and system neuroscience. And in other words, uh, try to understand uh, how the various properties, the cellular and subcellular properties of uh, cortical element uh, um, combine together to give rise uh, to those uh, uh, cortical computations. As a, as, a, as a model system, we use the mouse, and the main reason why we use the mouse is because uh, it is genetically tractable. And uh, the ability of using uh, um, uh, uh, genetic tools uh, to interrogate the circuit of visual cortex is, uh, is, is uh, an, immense, uh, an immense advantage. Uh, the reason why we work on with visual cortex like the, uh, rather than any other cortex is because uh, the, um, the parameter space right, that uh, allows us to drive visual cortex uh, is uh, very well characterized, mainly because of the effort of the past, over the past 60 years of system neuroscientists, in which uh, uh, we know exactly what type of stimulus to give and what, uh, parameter space within, uh, what parameters within that stimulus space we can change in order to modulate in a, and modify in a very controlled manner the response properties of neurons uh, in visual cortex. Now, uh, uh, we, we, we know very well that, uh, that uh, the vision in mice is, uh, is, uh, is not as sharp as uh, vision in classical uh, systems uh, like carnivores and primates, right? The visual acuity is much worse uh, in a mouse. The receptive field of an individual cortical neuron is gigantic. Imagine that the receptive field of a cortical neuron in primary visual cortex is about 10 to 20 degrees, right? Well, it's a fraction of a degree in, in a primate. Nevertheless, uh, right, despite, despite the, this, uh, this, uh, the, the, this, this major difference, uh, differences, there are uh, several computations that, have been origin that were originally described uh, in uh, the, the, the cortices of primates and uh, carnivores that could be <coughs> verified uh, in uh, uh, visual cortex uh, of mice, including orientation tuning, direction selectivity, spatial frequency tuning, temporal frequency tuning, contrast invariance, and, and so on. So we think that uh, visual cortex of the mouse uh, is a good model system to try and to understand uh, the cellular basis right, uh, for, those, uh, for those computations. But now this is a question that I actually get uh, uh, very often when I say that uh, I, study, I study visual cortex uh, in mouse, is um, do they actually use their primary visual cortex? Do they actually use it? And, um, and this is actually a biologically relevant question because uh, 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 mice have uh, a superior colliculus, uh, like I was discussing yesterday, and the superior colliculus is a, a very important uh, um, midbrain region that is involved in uh, many visually, um, um, uh, visually evoked behavior. So, so, so how do we know that actually mice, um, that visually evoked behavior in mice are not mainly driven by the superior colliculus uh, and, and that primary visual cortex is, uh, is of any relevance for visually guided behavior? So, so in the lab, we developed a, a visually guided behavior in mice. And, uh, and um, you see this uh, little mouse, it's head fixed and it's running on a circular treadmill. And um, as it runs on this circular treadmill, uh, images pass by on the monitor, which is on the right side of, uh, of this animal. And, um, and those images pass by at a speed, uh, which is uh, directly proportional to the speed at which this animal is running on its treadmill. And the animal is trained to um, uh, recognize the target image, which is a non-rotated black square. You saw it a moment ago. And then it's in the non-rotated black square, it has to place it in the center of the monitor. And uh, once it places it in the center of the monitor, it gets uh, rewarded by a drop of water. Those are water-restricted animals, and it's going to work uh, 
uh, for a very long time in order to get their water uh, by doing this. So you, clearly this is a visually guided behavior. The mice uh, bef behave, um, th 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 this video goes on for 40 minutes, so uh, you are w w very welcome to keep on watching it. So anyways, so, so, um, so here, here is a score of one of those mice. You see that uh, its top probability for the non-rotated square is very high, right? Almost one, so it's very well trained. If you rotate the square by about 15 degrees, right, the stop probability goes down to <coughs> maybe 50, 60 percent. And if the rotation is 30 or 45 degrees, uh, clearly uh, the mouse recognizes it as a distractor rather than a target in this other stop. So this is a visually guided behavior. It doesn't mean that it necessitates primary visual cortex, right? As I said before, it could be based on, for example, the superior colliculus. And so to address whether indeed this uh, visually guided behavior depends on visual cortex, we optogenetically silence the primary visual cortex contralateral to uh, the monitor. And as you can see, in this particular animal, once we silence primary visual cortex, essentially it no longer stops, right? It keeps on running when uh, the stimulus passes by. And this is, a spe this is specific to the silencing of the contralateral V1, because if in this mouse we silence the ipsilateral the primary visual cortex, the, the behavior is essentially unaffected. So clearly, mice uh, um, use the primary visual cortex, at least for this very specific discrimination behavior that uh, we have set up in the lab. And so this gives us the motivation to try to understand the actual computation that goes on in primary visual cortex, and in particular, their cellular basis. So today I would like to um, subdivide the talk in three parts. The first one is about the nature of the thalamic can I ask about this? Uh, you, you can ask whatever you want. <laughs> yesterday, I, w I just wanted to say, yesterday my talk went a little bit longer than <laughs> because of the questions. So I'm very happy if, uh, for to, to have questions, but then the talk might my, my, my last a little longer. So I go ahead. All right. Well, you, uh, you ask. Ask and... Uh, In this case, clearly for processing, it's also, in my opinion, it's also used for, for learning. But here, this is, a, we silence V1 acutely in, in um, after, after, after it learned, uh, we, take, we, we take this mouse, which is an exper expert mouse, and not only we, we silence visual cortex only for a few hundred milliseconds in interleaved trial. So it's acutely necessary. Good? All right. All right, so, so I'm going to divide my talk in three parts. The first part is about the nature of the thalamic input, right? What does the thalamic input uh, tell uh, primary visual cortex, right? The second is about uh, recurrent excitation within primary visual cortex. So this is the role of uh, recurrent excitation in, uh, in signal processing within uh, primary visual cortex. And the third is about the role of inhibition in shaping the operations that are performed in primary visual cortex. So let's start with, uh, with the thalamic input. And the question what, uh, that I'm going to ask is, what is the contribution of thalamic excitation to visually evoked activity? A uh, uh, very, uh, very simple question. And, um, and so, when, when, um, so first, uh, first uh, let's start with uh, some of the computation we want, to, we want to talk about. The experiment that I'm going to show you now are performed on anesthetized mice. Those are uh, in front of a computer monitor and we perform um, current clamp recording, hostile current clamp recording from neurons in layer four. And uh, as you probably have all uh, uh, learned in textbook, if you present gratings of a given orientation drifting in a given direction, you can uh, elicit a strong activity in a certain cortical neuron. For example, this particular neuron really likes a drifting grating, which is oblique in this direction and is drifting towards uh, about 11 o'clock. If you present an identical grating but has now vertical bars and is uh, drifting uh, towards 9 o'clock, you elicit much less activity in this neuron. You see much fewer spikes. And so you can, uh, you can explore uh, this parameter space. And what you observe, right, is that clearly this neuron likes uh, oblique gratings like this one and this one, right? And this is shown with this polar plot, which shows the response uh, uh, frequency of the neuron along the radius, right? Uh, relative to the orientation of the grating, right? And in fact, what you can observe is that not only it likes grating that have this orientation as highlighted in red, but it prefers when they drift 
towards 11 o'clock as compared to when they drift towards 5 o'clock, right? So there is orientation preference and direction preference. And this can be illustrated also more classically on a linear plot in which you have uh, the direction of the drifting rating, right, plotted against the response in firing rate, right? And you see that uh, you have essentially two peak, right, at 330 and 150 degrees, which gives you the orientation of the stimulus, right? And you see that, in fact, the firing rate is slightly higher when, uh, when, 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 when the drifting rating drifts towards 11 or 330 degrees as compared to 150, showing that not only there is orientation selectivity, but also direction selectivity. So the question, the specific question that we're not going to address is, what is the contribution of this thalamic input, right, to orientation and direction selectivity of neurons in layer four, which is the main thalamic recipient layer in uh, primary visual cortex. And so this question is very simple, right, as a question, but it's experimentally complex. And the reason why it's experimentally complex is that neurons in layer four do not only receive thalamic input, but also receive many excitatory input from neighboring neurons. In fact, they are, Im they are embedded in a very strong uh, um, recurrent connectivity network, right, from <laughs> neighboring neurons, such that uh, the actual number of synapses from neighboring neurons within layer four vastly outnumbers, right, the synapses that come uh, from the thalamus. And so if we record excitation from a, from a cortical neuron in layer four in response to a visual stimulus, we don't know how much of the excitation actually comes from, layer, from, from the thalamus directly or how much of visually evoked excitation comes from neighboring layer four neurons. And so to, to be able to, to address the nature of the thalamic input, we developed uh, a technique that allows us, uh, by harnessing the inhibitory network in cortex, to essentially completely silence uh, uh, pyramidal neurons uh, in visual cortex. We express channelrhodopsin in inhibitory neuron, and by shining light uh, to excite this channelrhodopsin, we can fire those inhibitory neurons and completely silence very rapidly and reversibly um, the, the, the all pyramidal cells in, uh, in, in cortex. And this allows us then to isolate the thalamic input. And so the experiment configuration is recording, uh, per performing a wholesale uh, voltage clamp recording from uh, a layer four neuron, then the, uh, silent visual cortex and isolate thalamic excitation. So the type of stimuli I'm going to present here is uh, uh, little squares, this is the to, 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 to identify the receptive field structure, little squares that appear uh, sparsely um, on, uh, on the monitor. And those little squares are five by five degree, and they can be either black or white. If they are black, this means that there is a local decrease in luminance because the monitor is gray. If they are white, there is a local increase in luminance, right? And then you can look at uh, the amount of the, the excitation that those various squares in an eight by eight matrix uh, uh, generate on the neuron we are, we are recording from. And this is an example cell. And um, each one of those traces uh, is uh, a current trace uh, for a square, a black square um, produced uh, at the corresponding position on the monitor. And you can see that the vast, the vast majority of the position where we flash a black square don't produce any, excited, any thalamic excitatory current. This is done during cortical silencing. But for the position which, is, which are more or less at the center of the monitor, and I highlighted them in purple just uh, to facilitate. We can do the same uh, with a uh, white square, increasing luminance. Uh, and again, as you see, the vast majority of positions don't produce any excitatory current originating from the thalamus, but for positions that are, again, more or less at the center of the monitor. And in fact, uh, there is a very large overlap between the on-receptive field, right, the uh, position where we pay put white, the, the position that produces thalamic excitation in response to um, white stimuli and the off receptive field, right? The special position that produces thalamic excitation in response to black square. There is a very strong uh, um, overlap, but um, the peak of those receptive fields, uh, this is the average of many similar experiments, are actually offset, right? This is shown here in the heat map and is shown uh, here. Uh, um, uh, and is shown here uh, with uh, uh, ISO excitation uh, um, contours. Uh, again, a large overlap, 
but the peaks are separated. And if you take a cross section here along the axis of the two peaks, you see that this separation is about five degrees. So a, a, a neuron in layer four gets thalamic excitation both to increase in luminances and decrease in luminance within a receptive field of about 20 degrees, but the maximal excitation to an increase in luminance has not the exact same spatial position as the maximal excitation to a decrease in luminance, right? The peaks are separated by about five degrees. So, and this reminds uh, what I was observed with uh, um, cross-correlation uh, between thalamic and uh, cortical activity via extracellular recording by Reed and Alonso in 1995 in the CAT. Uh, yes? Will you be I'm going, to dis I'm going to discuss the current uh, when I'm going to speak about uh, um, uh, direction selectivity. So, so, I'll, uh, so what are the consequences of this separation uh, of on and off receptive field uh, right at the thalamic input? Well, you can imagine that when you present a grating, right, uh, when the dark part of the grating, the dark band of the grating happen uh, to overlap with the off peak of the receptive field, uh, and the white part of the grating time, time, uh, uh, overlap with the peak of the on receptive field, you're going to have the maximal possible thalamic current, right? Because you maximally excite both the on portion and the off portion of the receptive field. As the grating moves, right, as the grating drifts, suddenly you're going to be in the opposite situation in which the white band overlaps with the off portion of the receptive field and the dark band with the on portion. And this is the worst possible way to excite the thalamic input, right? And so you're going to have uh, a, uh, a very little thalamic excitation. What happens if you present a grating, right, which is orthogonal, essentially in which the axis uh, of uh, the stripes of the grating are parallel to the axis that connects the peak of the on and of the off receptive field? Here you'll never have a situation in which you optimally excite uh, your uh, thalamic receptive field, neither a situation in which you completely suboptimally excite it, but you're going to have an intermediate current along no matter what the position of uh, uh, the bands of the gratings are, right? So this is the prediction of this on-off separation. And this is this correction, uh, if, if this position is correct, right? the amplitude of uh, the fluctuation of thalamic excitation as uh, the drifting grating passes by, and this is called um, F1 modulation of thalamic excitation, is going to be maximal, right, of amplitude fluctuation from largest thalamic excitation to most, uh, the smallest thalamic excitation, is going to be maximal for a certain orientation of the grating and minimal for orthogonal orientation. Essentially, the F1 modulation of thalamic excitation should be tuned to the orientation of the grating. And so, we can test that directly experimentally, which is uh, first uh, by analyzing the structure of the thalamic receptive field in the animal, predict uh, the preferred orientation of the grating uh, based on the receptive field structure of on and off subregion, and then test it by actually presenting grating of various orientation. And this is what uh, um, Tony Lee and did in my lab. This is again a map of the off receptive field, of the on receptive field. They're shown as contour plot right here. You see that the axis that connect the peak of the on and the off uh, is this one, predicting a preferred orientation for a drifting rating of here, and then we test for drifting rating. And here is the response in voltage clamp again, right? So excitation is downwards of uh, um, a thalamic excitation for grating presented a various orientation and direction. And you see that there are orientation, like this hor uh, horizontal orientation, that produce clearly an excitatory current, but with very little F1 modulation, right? Well, there are other orientation, like this one, that also produce an excitatory current, but with a much stronger F1 modulation. And if we up, uh, plot the amplitude of the F1 modulation, right, here on this polar plot, we see that it, uh, it's very close about um, uh, 12 to 15 degrees close relative to the predicted preferred um, um, orientation of the grating based on the receptive field structure um, of, uh, of the thalamic input. And this is uh, a plot for uh, a number of similar experiments. So orientation tuning, right, the ability of a neuron to respond to grating of a given orientation 
derive from the fact that the on and the off receptive field, as they come from the thalamic input, are separated, and in the case of the mouse, by about five degrees. So what the, what the, what, what, uh, what determines uh, direction selectivity? You have a question. This is still only at the level of the input from the thalamus. Yes. So I'll address that uh, uh, in, in a moment. Uh, let me speak about direction selectivity. So, uh, brief answer. The output of that neuron in current lamp in terms of firing is perfectly predicted by the receptive field structure of its thalamic input. Despite the fact that, as you will see in a moment, most of the excitation that the neuron receives is actually from recurrent collateral from, the, from, uh, from, from, from cortical neurons. And, uh, but but we, we'll go into it soon. So what determines direction selectivity? I've told you about what determines the ability of a neuron to respond better, right, to a grating of a given orientation. But how come does this neuron respond better when the grating of the given orientation drifts towards 11 o'clock rather than down towards uh, uh, 5 o'clock, right? In fact, the orientation is exactly the same. Why we should we prefer uh, a, a drifting direction as compared to the other? And uh, this is illustrated here, right? So uh, those are the, the, the responses of thalamic excitation. Remember right now we're just completely focusing on thalamic excitation. So all the data that I'm showing you, uh, unless I specify otherwise, is while we're optogenetically silenced cortex. So it's really isolating the pure thalamic input. So this is the response to drifting gratings, right? So a uh, vertical grating drifting to the right, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I present here 12 of them actually subdivided in, in uh, in, in more, but what you can clearly see here by analyzing the amplitude, right, of the F1 modulation is that uh, uh, this particular neuron, uh, in terms of thalamic excitation, prefers not only horizontal grating, right, but actually horizontal grating that go down as compared to horizontal grating that go up, right? You can see that so this F1 modulation is much larger, right, for those horizontal grating going down as compared to one going up, right? And this is a uh, this is actually the tuning curve for this neuron, right? They prefer going up and down, and this is on a linear plot, this is a polar plot. And uh, something quite important that I would like to stress now is that if you look at the uh, integral of the current, right, essentially the so-called charge, the temporal integral of the current over the entire duration of the visual stimulus, it is identical no matter what the orientation and direction of the stimulus is. This is the tuning curve of the charge, right? So essentially, what, what in other words, what this means is the amount of glutamate that is released by the thalamic neurons on top of the neuron that we are recording is the same no matter what the orientation and direction of the stimulus is. Always the same. What changes is actually the distribution in time of this release of glutamate. It's relatively homogeneous here, right? Little modulated, and it's strongly modulated in time here. So this is what the charge tells us. So the amplitude of thalamic excitation is clearly directionally selective, as shown here. And how is direction selectivity of thalamic excitation generated, right? So thalamic excitation must summate in time since it's the same no matter what the direction and orientation is, thalamic excitation must submit in time more efficiently in one direction as compared to the other. This means that the time course of thalamic excitation must depend on the specific phase of the stimulus, and I'm going to explain this in more detail now. So what uh, Tony Lian decided to do is to first identify what uh, the preferred orientation and direction is, and then presents to that neuron stimuli, which are made of static grating, essentially still frames of the little movie, right? A flash static grating of the preferred orientation, right here, horizontal, but not drifting, it's static, and presenting it at various phases, okay? And so this is one phase that produces this thalamic excitation, this is another phase that you can see it shifted by um, a few degrees, about 20 degrees, right, just slightly up, and it produces a slightly larger thalamic excitation, another phase, and so on. And here we present 
all those horizontal uh, gratings, right, which are the preferred orientation at various phases. <coughs> and so the first thing that you should notice is that there are some phases that produce larger thalamic excitation as compared to other phases. And this makes sense relative to what I was explaining you before, that uh, the uh, thalamic receptive field of the neuron is subdivided in on and off receptive field. And so there are phases that are optimally aligned to the peak of the on and the off, and they produce a lot of thalamic excitation, while there are other phases that are probably uh, opposite, right, 180 degrees opposite, and produce uh, su suboptimal. So that makes sense. However, there is something more interesting that you could notice here. There are some phases that produce thalamic excitation that decays quickly, and some phases that produce thalamic excitation that decays slowly, right? It's very clear. And so the idea here is that if you have some phases that produce thalamic excitation that decay slowly, if those phases um, during a drifting rating are to precede the phases that produce thalamic excitation that decays fastly, Thalamic excitation that decays fast will ride on the tail of thalamic excitation produced by the previous phase that decays slowly. So you're going to be able to summate thalamic excitation efficiently if this phase here precedes this phase. Because by the time this phase comes, uh, the, the excitation produced by this phase hasn't completely decayed. In the other direction, it's the opposite. If, 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 if the movie goes in the other direction, you first have a phase that produces fast thalamic excitation, then you have a phase that produces a slow thalamic excitation, and the slow thalamic excitation is not going to ride on the tail of fast thalamic excitation. Just one moment. So we decided to, to test this very simply, right, by summing, uh, by summing either in one direction or the other, the, um, essentially by reproducing a movie based on the excitatory responses uh, uh, from uh, uh, flash state ingrating simply by staggering those responses to mimic either a drifting rating in this direction or a drifting rating in this direction. And this is, this is if we make a drifting rating in this direction where the slow precedes the fast, and this is for mimicking three or four cycles, right? You, you can recognize the slow one and the fast one here. They are all time staggered to reproduce uh, a drifting rating of this speed. And when you can see this produces, uh, if, if you sum all, to, all of those currents, the sum of them produce a very nice F1 modulation. If you take the exact same current and sum them in the other direction, right, then you see that the F1 modulation is much less. And in fact, there is a very nice correlation, a part of a few, of a few exceptions, between the actual direction preference uh, of the neuron, right, to drifting rating, and the direction preference of the neuron predicted by summing uh, the response to static grating, either mimicking one direction or the other. But first, just a clarification, the title here is a static rating, so is it really flashing and leaving it on, right? It's for 250 milliseconds. Ah, and then you remove it? Yeah. When you go from the middle to the bottom, and you're imagining that you're replacing one static rating by the other, I would imagine that you need also to know what is the response to removal of the previous one. All right, so we, in, in this case here, we um, didn't analyze the off response. Uh, we only analyze the on response. Uh, what you're saying is a, is a good point. So when you remove a grating, this is a, a very strong uh, off response. Now, when the grating uh, are drifting, depending whether uh, the, the off responses are, ha have a, uh, they cannot be mimicked by, 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 by. anyhow, uh, the sum here doesn't consider the off response. So that's a good point. I should have clarified that. Uh, Massimo, yes. how flexible is this in terms of the, um, the frequency that this can capture? So, uh, all right, so very good. So um, that's a very good point too. So the decay of this, uh, of the excitatory postsynaptic current generated by a flash grating should predict uh, uh, the temporal frequency of the grating. And indeed it predicts it, uh, but we didn't test it. We didn't verify it. And the reason why we didn't verify it is that we, there are, so our whole cell recording um, presenting first drifting rating and then static rating takes a lot of time, and so we didn't have time to present also drifting rating at various temporal frequencies. But yes, there is a very clear prediction, right, 
and this depends on every cell on the temporal, on the ideal temporal frequency of those grating based on the decay time constant of this excitatory current. Absolutely. All right. So the time course of thalamic excitation depends on the, spe depends on the special phase of the stimulus. Phase eliciting slow excitation precedes phase eliciting fast excitation for optimal submission determinant the, the preferred direction. And so now the key question is how come, how come when I present a certain phase, I have fast decay, and when I present other phases of the stimulus, I have a slow decay of excitation, right? What determines the time course of thalamic excitation? And so what we decided to test, whether it could be simply the firing of the thalamic neurons, right? Simply whether th this decay actually depends uh, on the time course of firing of the presynaptic thalamic neurons. Again, this is a, a simple question, but experimentally it's quite complex because in order to be able to address it, you need to do paired recordings. You need to do a whole recording from layer four neurons and simultaneously record in the thalamus thalamic neurons which are actually connected to the cortical neuron you are recording from, right? And in this way, what you can do is compare the kinetics of the excitatory current that you record in the cortical neuron with the kinetics of the firing of the thalamic neuron which are presynaptic to the cortical neuron that you are recording from. Does this make sense? Kind of, right? So, and this experiment, again, was done by Tony Lee, and he's a fantastic experimentalist. What he did, he put an extracellular recording electrode in the DLGN and recorded in whole cell from layer four neuron. And now I'm going to show you a very nice uh, example uh, this, is, uh, his, uh, this is a recording from um, a pyramidal neuron. This is uh, now a current clamp recording without cortical silencing to begin with, and this demonstrates that this cell is indeed directionally selective. It really likes vertical grating drifting to the right, and it doesn't like the same vertical grating drifting to the left, right? And uh, what uh, the beauty of this, of this uh, particular experiment, uh, of, this, of this individual particular experiment, is that Tony was able to isolate actually two thalamic units, both of them that contacted this uh, directionally selective uh, cortical neuron. And the fact that you have a monosynaptic connection is illustrated here. Now we are in voltage clamp and we're silencing visual cortex that uh, if you align the firings that occur spontaneously in this unit one, you can see a unitary postsynaptic current in, uh, uh, in this cortical neuron. And if you align uh, to the uh, voltage clamp recordings, uh, um, do you align the voltage clamp recording to uh, spontaneous firing in unit two that occurs in the thalamus, again, you can see a very nice unitary excitatory postsynaptic current. This type of fair recording is quite rare, but we did it often enough to have a few, even a few examples in which you had two presynaptic units to the same postsynaptic neuron. And so let's see how unit one and unit two fire, right? in response to static grating presented at the preferred orientation for these neurons. And so first of all, this is the thalamic excitation that we record in response to one phase of the static grating, right? This is very similar to what I showed you a slide ago. And this is um, the thalamic excitation that you record in the same cortical neuron in response to a different phase of the static grating. Now, instead of showing you all the phases, I'm showing you just two phases, one that produces a relatively fast thalamic excitation and one that produces a relatively slow thalamic excitation. Let's see what happens with unit one and unit two in response to the phase of the static grating that produces fast thalamic excitation. And this is a peristimulus time histogram. It essentially shows the firing rate in time of unit one and unit two in response to those, uh, uh, the static grating. You see that unit one responds very briskly and briefly in response to the static grating, while unit two responds very little, right? So essentially, <coughs> only unit one of those two units respond. When we present uh, this other phase of the, of the static grating, now the situation is completely different, right? Uh, now unit one still responds briefly, but unit two responds uh, uh, much lower, right? Consistent with uh, the much lower response. Uh, that, uh, um, that we record uh, in uh, the cortical neurons. And so we've repeated this for about uh, 20 similar pairs, and there is a very strong correlation between the time course uh, of uh, thalamic excitation, right, 
and the time course of firing of uh, simultaneously recorded uh, uh, thalamic units presynaptic to the neuron we're recording from depending on uh, the phase of the grazing. And so direction selectivity uh, in uh, layer 4 cortical neuron, at least relative to the thalamic input, right, is based on the fact uh, that um, as a stimulus passes by, it's going to uh, first um, excite thalamic neurons that have a sustained firing, following by thalamic neurons that has a transient firing. And the spatial temporal summation of thalamic excitation allow for a very strong F1 modulation in one direction and not in the other, I was explaining before. Well, orientation selectivity uh, results from the fact that you have the combination of on and off uh, uh, thalamic input, which are spatially offset on average by five degrees, that converge on the same uh, thalamic neuron. So how about recurrent excitation? Right now I've been uh, um, identifying uh, some uh, uh, basic properties of thalamic excitation and how the combination, the spatial and the temporal combination of thalamic input onto individual cortical neuron layer four endows this neuron with direction selectivity and orientation selectivity. So what is the contribution of uh, recurrent excitation, as uh, one of you was asking before, to this uh, computation? Um, and so the first experiment is very simple. Uh, we want to know uh, how much uh, of the total excitation that a neuron receives in response to a visual stimulus uh, um, uh, comes uh, from uh, uh, recurrent excitatory synapses. And uh, so we can uh, um, record uh, uh, total excitation in response to a visual stimulus, and this is without silencing visual cortex. And then we can silence visual cortex and we can see how much remains, and the portion that remains, as I was telling you before, is thalamic excitation. And on average, right, about 60 to 70 percent, in fact, <coughs> about 70 percent of the total excitation onto a cortical neuron is through recurrent and only about 30% come from the thalamus. So in, in response to a visual stimulus, the vast majority of excitation is actually recurrent excitation. And this is consistent uh, with previous work by Furster in CAT and uh, more recent work by the lab of Wittau in uh, mice. So vast majority of visual evoked excitation is uh, of cortical origin. And so now the question comes, how is this cortical excitation, right, tuned relative to the thalamic input? since it's in fact uh, the majority of the excitation. And uh, the answer is very simple. This cortical excitation, right, that we extract by subtracting thing, thalamic excitation from total excitation has uh, both the same uh, orientation and direction selectivity as the thalamic excitation, right? So the majority of excitation come from a cortical neuron, but those cortical neurons are tuned to the same uh, um, orientation and direction as uh, what emerges from the thalamic input on that particular cell, right? And here for the aficionados, not only is the tuning the same, but the actual phase of the F1 modulation is the same, meaning that <coughs> the neurons uh, that converge uh, onto uh, the neuron we're recording from are not tuned for the same orientation and direction that uh, emerges from the conversion of the thalamic input, but in addition have actually the same uh, uh, a spatial receptive field structure in terms of on and off uh, um, uh, receptive field. And this is consistent uh, with uh, uh, di a direct demonstration in layer 2-3 by the lab of uh, Thomas Mirzich Floga, in which he recorded from parents so that the receptive field structure is the same between neurons in layer 2-3 that uh, excite each other. So this is in layer 4? This is, yeah, everything I'm showing you is in layer 4. Oh, no, I'm not saying that. No, what, what I say is that uh, in layer four, 70% of excitation comes from the recurrent and 30% uh, comes from the thalamus. I'm not saying that the same. I, I'm just saying uh, what the, the parallel here is that uh, uh, a neuron with a, a similar structure of the receptive field tend to excite each other. That's, that's what I was saying, both in layer four and in layer two, three. Yes. So, so when you Yes. So 
Well, it's not exactly comparable, but the direction selectivity is exactly the same. In fact, we show this in, uh, in, um, in our last paper, uh, Lien 2018, that the, fire, that the, the, the tuning in spiking, when you, the, 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 the tuning of the neuron in terms of firing output in the absence of any uh, optogenetic uh, manipulation uh, matches uh, the tuning of the thalamic input. But 70% could be actually much more excitation that is contrasted by, you know, um, in addition Oh, absolutely, to absolutely, uh, I, absolutely, yes. So, so recurrent excitation, right? So, so the majority, so a visual stimulus produces uh, a situation such that, in fact, that might be related to your question, such that uh, once, uh, once this, uh, this uh, visual stimulus is driving cortex, right, uh, the majority of excitation comes from visual cortex. And so the question comes as um, whether, how long does this uh, visual evoked activity persist uh, in the absence of an ongoing thalamic input. In theory, you could imagine, right? You have this thalamic input that drives the cortex. The cortex is driven. The vast majority of excitation comes from the cortex. You could actually remove the thalamic input and things could go on for a while, right? Um, and so, in other words, what is the cortical decay time constant, right? Uh, um, how long does cortical activity, which has been evoked by a visual stimulus, persist if we were able to remove uh, the thalamic input. This is again a simple question, but we cannot do it just by simply removing the visual input, because removing a visual input is a stimulus per se, because any change in luminance in the visual field is a stimulus. So we cannot just flash a visual stimulus, remove the visual stimulus, and see how long it takes for visual cortex to come back to baseline, because as I said, removing a visual stimulus is a stimulus per se. What we need to do is uh, um, abolish activity, gate activity in the thalamus. And so this is what Kim Reynolds did in my lab. She used again a, an optogenetic approach, used on inhibition, he expressed channel dopsin in the um, uh, nucleus reticularis thalami, which is the major inhibitory nucleus of the thalamus. And by doing this, she can silence uh, the thalamus with a time course of two milliseconds, incredibly fast. And so <coughs> this is uh, such an experiment. This is a multi-unit recording now. Um, uh, from a mouse uh, throughout visual cortex. She presents a visual stimulus, and the visual cumulus can literally be anything. It can be a flash, a static stimulus, a drifting grating. It really doesn't matter for the purpose of this, uh, of, um, of this experiment. And if you, if you can see, this visual stimulus produces uh, activity in visual cortex. And uh, when she silences the thalamus, visual evoked activity comes back to baseline. Uh, very quickly, and our surprise was that, in fact, uh, uh, activity in cortex come back to baseline with a time constant of about 10 milliseconds. So despite the fact uh, that the majority of excitation that is generated in, uh, by a visual stimulus is of cortical origin, as soon as you remove that minoritarian thalamic input, cortical activity goes down with a very fast time constant of 10 milliseconds, and this is likely to be due to what you were saying before, namely that this cortical excitation likely comes, obviously comes with a lot, uh, a lot of inhibition. So the ca cortical decay time constant is fast, right? And when I say it's fast, it's comparable to the time constant of an individual neuron, despite the fact that we've uh, activated a whole network of, uh, of hundreds, if not thousands, of neurons. And so what uh, Kim Reynolds wanted to ask is whether this cortical decay constant is capable of predicting some important properties, uh, some dynamic properties of visual cortex. And, um, and this is the experiment she did. Essentially, she uh, modulated uh, uh, temporally a visual stimulus simply by modulating the luminance of the visual stimulus sinusoidally, by modulating it sinusoidally at various frequencies, right? And recorded simultaneously from cortex extracellularly and from thalamus extracellularly. And the idea is that you, could you, could, uh, you can record this, uh, the response of thalamic, uh, the thalamic response to this uh, temporally modulated visual stimulus, take the thalamic response, filter it uh, via a time constant uh, of 10 milliseconds, and, if, uh, and, and see whether you can predict uh, the cortical response, and then verify it through a cortical recording. And so this is, um, this is the um, uh, extracellular uh, multi-unit uh, response uh, Actually, this is a multi-unit of isolated unit, but it doesn't matter. This is the response of the thalamus uh, 
to um, luminance modulated stimulus at 4 hertz, at 6 hertz, 8 hertz, 14 hertz, and 20 hertz. As you can see, the thalamus like stimuli very much between 6 and 8 hertz, and then uh, after 20 hertz, it stops uh, really following them, right? And uh, if you take, uh, if you take uh, this uh, uh, response of the thalamus, and you feel, and this is this is the frequency response of the thalamus, stimulus frequency rather um, uh, against amplitude. And if you take if you take this uh, the response uh, of um, of the thalamus and uh, you filter it right uh, with uh, this um, cortical time constant of uh, of, uh, of 10 milliseconds, this is what you predict uh, um, the response of the cortex should be right. Essentially, it should filter out. Uh, uh, stuff uh, essentially above uh, 15 hertz. This is what uh, Kim predicted, and this is in fact what she measured. So the, the, the measurement of the response of the frequency response of the cortex very well matches uh, the predicted response based uh, on the thalamic input filtered by this uh, 10 millisecond time constant. So this 10 millisecond cortical the 10 kind constant predicts the V1 frequency response um, quite well, right? And so, and so I would like to 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 now having uh, yes. The part of this uh, no effect to adaptation. Uh, what do you mean no effect to adaptation? Because we just uh, there is some adaptation here, right? No, but this is the uh, expired. Yes. As it goes to the core. Oh, very good. Yes. So we actually measure that. Uh, um, in order to make this calculation, she actually, uh, Kim actually included the adaptation that, uh, that exists at the thalamic synapse. But here is a very important point. Why the thalamic synapses adapt very strongly in an anesthetized animal, it essentially doesn't adapt in an awake animal. Though there is very little, if any, uh, frequency dependent depression of the thalamic input to the cortex in an awake animal, while in the same animal it's very strong if you anesthetize it. So there is a, uh, essentially in an awake animal where those experiments were done, there is a very little thalamic adap uh, adaptation of the synaptic. Uh, essentially it's because of the baseline. They are, they are, they are pre depressed. They are pre depressed. In fact, the, the thalamic input is much smaller in an awake animal than in an um, than in a anesthetized animal. Very good. And so I'd like to finish uh, by showing you uh, some results uh, about um, how inhibition uh, shape um, those, uh, those responses. I told you about the thalamic input. I told you about the role of uh, recurrent excitation. I'd like to finish uh, with inhibition. And uh, so what is the contribution of inhibition to visually evoked activity? This is a big and complex question, and we are just uh, starting to actually understand it. And so I would like to show you a couple of results, first relative to inhibition and gain control. And this brings us to a very specific cell type, which is uh, the parvalbumin expressing uh, inhibitory neurons. Uh, they represent uh, about uh, a third uh, of, uh, of, the cortical neuro of the cortical inhibitory neuron in visual cortex. They are themselves a uh, heterogeneous population. I might show you some data relative to that. And, uh, and so we, we, what is, um, uh, we, since we had uh, essentially genetic access uh, to those neurons because there is a mouse line that expresses cre recombinase selectively into parvabumin expressing neurons, we wanted to know um, what is their contribution to visual processing. And so <coughs> uh, our, our first experiment were relatively simple. We expressed uh, optogenetic actuator both to either suppress their activity or excite them. And as you can see, we could control them quite well. If they express archaeorhodopsin, we can. Uh, um, uh, we can suppress uh, um, the activity of PV neuron. The gray, uh, the, the, the gray rectangle represents the presence uh, of, uh, of a visual stimulus. This is uh, a raster plot. Under control condition, this neuron fires a lot. If we suppress it uh, with archaeorhodopsin, it fires very little. And, this, uh, and this, those are uh, targeted recordings from PV expressing neuron under the two photon microscope, right? And uh, we can also activate them with channel rhodopsin, so we have a very nice bidirectional control of those neurons. And so what happens to the response of pyramidal neurons uh, when we either activate parvalbumin neuron or suppress parvalbumin neuron? What happens both to their direction selectivity and the orientation selectivity? 
So this is uh, the summary graph of uh, the orientation and direction tuning of uh, a, a population of pyramidal cells, right? This is already a summary graph. And this is what happens if we suppress uh, uh, parvalbumin cells. If uh, we don't completely suppress them, we, about, we reduce their activity by about 50%. As you would expect, right? As you would expect, uh, um, pyramidal neurons respond more vigorously uh, to, to visual stimulation, right? And they respond more vigorously, essentially, no matter what the orientation is. However, what is uh, very important is that uh, this increase uh, in, uh, in, um, in activity of the pyramidal cell is a proportional of the response under control condition of the pyramidal cell to that particular stimulus to begin with. And this is, uh, if we plot the pyramidal cell response under control condition versus uh, uh, when we are suppressing the activity of our valbumin neuron, as you can see, <coughs> there is essentially a fractional increase in the activity of the pyramidal cell, no matter what the, uh, what the intensity of the response of the pyramidal cell is. In other ways, there is a change in gain in the response of the pyramidal cell. We don't affect the orientation selectivity, and we don't affect the direction selectivity. And the same happens if you activate parvalbumin neuron. By activating parvalbumin neuron, you clearly reduce uh, the response uh, of pyramidal cell, but apart from <coughs> a, a, a rectification here, when, when the pyramidal cell no longer fire, we have essentially a change, uh, a change in gain. So parvalbumin cell, parvalbumin cells is, uh, expressing cell control, the gain of pyramidal neurons. And um, uh, recently we described a very specific parvalbumin expressing neuron, which, send it, uh, which has uh, its cell body located uh, in uh, um, the deep layers of the cortex, but sends uh, its uh, axonal arborization throughout uh, all cortical layers. And we can selectively activate those neurons by activating layer six pyramidal cell. And if we do that, we um, are able to suppress the activity across all cortical layers, consistent with the axonal arborization of this parvalbumin neuron. But we do this without affecting the tuning property across all cortical layers. So, to this very specific parvalbumin expressing neuron that inhibits the entire cortical column, if you want, we can change the gain of the response of the entire cortical column, either by increasing or decreasing, a little bit like if you had your volume knob on your hi-fi. I would like to finish by speaking about uh, uh, the role of inhibition and contextual modulation. Contextual modulation is a very important aspect of visual processing. In fact, uh, it occurs constantly, right, as uh, you are uh, uh, exploring a visual scene. And it's, uh, it's been, um, this has been uh, explored psychophysically and electrophysiologically uh, for many decades. Uh, and a very nice, uh, <coughs> a very nice uh, uh, um, uh, psychophysical uh, um, uh, a way to, to, to demonstrate this effect is the following. Here you, see, here you see a central patch that has a high contrast granularity, and all of you can see that the, the patch, the smaller patch in the center, has a lower contrast granularity, right? And now I could ask you, each of you, to match the lower contrast granularity here at the center patch with one of those surrounding patches, right? And the average viewer would say that the center granularity here has a contrast that maybe matches some of those uh, top ones. Well, in fact, it's this one, right? It's very hard to believe even when you know it. I had to go in Photoshop, cut it out, put it nearby to see that it's indeed the case, right? So it's a visual illusion even when you know that it's a fact. And this is a, <coughs> there is a, this is a very known uh, contextual modulation of, uh, of, your, uh, of, of a stimulus. And there is a very strong electrophysiological, very, very clear electrophysiological signature that was first discovered, I think, in monkeys um, um, for this. And, uh, and, and, and it's the following. If you present a stimulus um, of increasing diameter, as you increase the diameter, eventually you feel the receptive field of that stimulus, right? And you have the maximal response uh, of... Uh, uh, of, uh, of the neuron, but if you keep on increasing the diameter to, uh, of the stimulus to invade uh, um, uh, a region that are outside the receptive field of the neuron, at least outside the classical receptive field, you start suppressing the response, right? 
And this is, this is a phenomenon called surround suppression in the visual cortex, and it's considered to be the electrophysiological signature of, uh, of this uh, perceptual illusion, for example, um, I showed you before. <coughs> so we wanted to know what the um, circuit basis is for surround suppression. And so first we had to verify that this surround suppression exists also in mice, and in it it exists, this is an awake mouse, we present a small stimulus, and we isolate a neuron in visual cortex, and we have a small response, a slightly larger uh, stimulus produces a larger response, but it produces a very, we, we present a very large stimulus. We have a, we, we suppress this response. And so what is the mechanism for this surround suppression? An idea is that you might have an inhibitory <coughs> neuron, right, that responds to very large stimuli, and when this inhibitory neuron that responds to very large stimuli is activated by a large visual stimulus, it eventually uh, suppresses the response of the pyramidal cells. And so the hypothetic, this is a tuning curve of the pyramidal cell as the size increases, the firing first increases and then decreases, and the hypothetical tuning curve of the inhibitory neuron that would produce surround suppression should essentially be a tuning curve that increases progressively as the stimulus increases. And so this brings us to somatostatin um, expressed in inhibitory neuron. It's another large class of inhibitory neuron that is also represent about 30% of all inhibitory neuron in visual cortex, and it's not overlapping with TD3. And so we recorded from those inhibitory neurons, and what we observed is that they are essentially, they have response properties to stimuli of increasing size that match what we would expect for a neuron to produce surround suppression. They don't respond to small stimuli, they respond intermediately to intermediate stimulus, and they very strongly respond to large stimuli. And so somatostatin cells prefer larger stimuli as compared to pyramidal cells. And this led us to two key questions. How come do they prefer larger stimuli? And second, do they actually contribute to surround suppression? And so why do, they re why, why do those somatostatin cell inhibitory neurons prefer larger stimuli as compared to pyramidal cells, right? If you are a neuron in layer 2, 3, you have essentially two sources of excitation, one that comes from layer 4 and one that comes from layer 2, 3, right? Recurrent excitation. And what is the main source of excitation from some cells? We did in vitro recording, we recorded from somatostatin cell and pyramidal neuron and activated optogenetically layer 4. And somatostatin cells don't respond to layer 4 activation in contrast to pyramidal cells. So despite the fact that they are in layer 2, 3, right, they don't get the direct input from layer 4 as every other pyramidal cell in layer 2, 3. They don't care. And, and this is not the case for every inhibitory neuron because PV cells really get strongly excited in a feedforward manner by, by layer 4. And this is summarized here. In contrast, somatostatin cells are very strongly excited from other pyramidal cells within layer 2, 3. So they don't get feedforward input coming from layer 4. They get essentially recurrent or horizontal input within uh, layer 2, 3, right? And so <coughs> this is, uh, this is uh, if you want, uh, the schematic uh, of our canonical circuit. Pyramidal cells get input from layer 4, right? And uh, parvalbumin neuron get it from layer 2, 3. Um, pyramidal cell 2, but somatostatin cells selectively from layer 2, 3. And this allows them to have a very large receptive field because the, <coughs> the, 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 the larger the stimulus that you present uh, to visual cortex, if you consider the retinotopic organization of visual cortex, the stronger the excitation of somatostatin cells, right? And uh, do they actually contribute to, to, to surround suppression? Indeed they do. This is, a, this is a, a, the recording from a pyramidal neuron under control condition for stimuli of increasing size. As you can see, those pyramidal cells show very now surround suppression. And if you optogenetically uh, remove from the circuit uh, somatostatin cell, you relieve at least part uh, of, the, of, the, of the surround suppression. So clearly somatostatin cells contribute to surround suppression in D1, right? And probably they do it uh, by being by inhibiting pyramidal cells, but by inhibiting pyramidal cells uh, progressively more as the stimulus get bigger and bigger, because as the stimulus get bigger and bigger, you, record, you recruit more and more pyramidal cells within layer 2, 3. And by recording, recruiting more and more pyramidal cells, you strongly activate somatostatin cells, thereby inhibiting pyramidal cells 
at the center. And so finally, very briefly, I spoke about pyramidal neurons, how they are integrated in the circuit, parvalbumin cells, somatostatin cells, how do they inhibit each other. We, we, we use, again, an optogenetic approach in slices. We recorded from somatostatin cell, pyramidal cell, and activated parvalbumin neuron optogenetically. And uh, as you can see, when we activate parvalbumin neuron optogenetically in a slice, pyramidal cells are strongly inhibited by parvalbumin neuron. This is very well known. But somatostatin cells receive very little inhibition from parvalbumin cells. This is shown in this example recording and in this plot. So parvalbumin cells inhibit pyramidal cells, but they seem not to inhibit somatostatin cells. And also, very importantly, parvalbumin cells, using the same approach, inhibit one another. So that's very important. For somatostatin cells, the situation is different. They clearly inhibit pyramidal cells. And this is, again, using an optogenetic approach in slices. They strongly inhibit parvalbumin cells, right? But they do not inhibit one another, right? So the way that parvalbumin cell and somatostatin cell are integrated into the circuit is very different. Parvalbumin cell inhibit pyramidal cell in limited and inhibit each other, while somatostatin cells do not inhibit each other. They meet parvalbumin cell and they inhibit uh, pyramidal neuron. So in conclusion, what I've shown you is that uh, relative to the thalamic input, the spatial separation of thalamic excitation in on and off subregion determines the orientation selectivity of layer 4 neurons. The spatial separation of transient and sustained thalamic neurons determine the direction selectivity of layer 4 neurons. In other words, direction selectivity in layer 4 is the result of a sp spatial and temporal integration of uh, thalamic input. Recurrent cortical excitation is co-tuned with and amplifies thalamic excitation, right? And recurrent cortical excitation has very fast dynamics, and those fast dynamics predict the frequency response of the cortex. Finally, parvalbumin expressing inhibitory neuron control the gain of, the, of this cortical amplification I was uh, referring to a moment ago. And somatic expre somatostatin expressing inhibitory neuron provide contextual modulation, at least relative to this surround suppression we were referring to before. And very importantly, both parvalbumin and somatostatin inhibitory cells are very differentially integrated into the cortical circuit. And so this was the work of Tony Lian that uh, explored the nature of thalamic excitation, both for orientation and direction selectivity, of Kimberly Reynolds, who studied uh, the cortical uh, time constant uh, and its role in the res frequency response of cortex, uh, of Mikshan Su, who uh, studied the excitation inhibition ratio in pyramidal cells, but I decided to remove those uh, data because uh, uh, it would have been uh, absolutely too long, so I apologize to Ming Shan for not having shown this stuff, of Bassam Atala, who looked at Parvamu in cells and gained control, of Sean Olson, who, together with Dante Bortone, looked at gain control in layer 6 with this big translaminar inhibitory neuron, of Hilela Desnik, who studied the uh, somatostatin cell and surround modulation, and of Carsten Pfeffer, who looked at the interaction between inhibitory neurons. Thank you very much.